Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a product of an economic system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. As the poor cotton farmers of East Texas and the South searched for a way out of their poverty, they identified the source of their conditions as the railroads and the East Coast banks. The farmers began to develop a system of farming co-ops and banking mechanisms independent of these powerful institutions. While creating the new systems, the populists advocated for structural changes to the political system. They realized that neither two political parties, Republicans in the North and Democrats in the South, served them. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identified with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today, our guest is Arthur Stimolis. Arthur is the executive director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign here in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to the show, Arthur. Thanks for having me. Great. Yeah, you've been on before, so we welcome you back. Thanks. Great. Yeah, so uh, the last time you were on, we talked about three trade agreements that President Obama had inherited by, from President Bush mm -hmm. and he was promoting. Uh, they have since passed. Tell us just a little bit about those those, those agreements. Yeah, the Korea, Colombia, and Panama free trade agreements mm -hmm. um, were the biggest package of free trade deals in over a decade. Um, they're agreements that the federal government's own International Trade Commission warned would increase the overall U.S. trade deficit if they were passed. Um, and you know, President Obama worked with the vast majority of the Republican Party uh, to get them through. Um, and they're, they're now more or less the law of the land. They still need to be implemented uh, over the coming year, but um, they're moving forward. Mm -hmm. And have the agreements all been approved by the other countries as well? Uh, yes, they have. The, the most controversial of them um, was South Korea where um, you know it was a huge huge front page issue it, it still is uh, just yesterday there were upwards of 10,000 people out in the streets protesting it um, the ruling party the Grand National Party in South Korea um, more or less blocked the uh, the opposition parties from even participating in the vote one of one of the minor party candidates actually opened up a tear gas canister in the hall of <laughs> <laughs> Parliament to try to stop the vote, um, but but it did pass and it is moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. There are some attempts in the court system there to try to block it, but we'll mm -hmm. see, we'll see how that goes. Okay, yeah. And then I was reading, you know, one of the one of the supposed uh, benefits, of course, is that President Obama talked about was is going to create American jobs. Yeah. Uh, that, so the president um, talked repeatedly about exports, and and certainly it will increase exports in a few small areas and there'll be some jobs created with that but they've completely ignored the other side of the equation imports um, and their own study suggested that uh, they will increase imports far more than they'll increase exports mm -hmm. and those imports obviously are going to displace a lot of American jobs so overall 
These are net job killers. Um, they don't really benefit working people in any country. Um, the Korea Pact, which is by far the biggest of the PACs, actually had rule of origin provisions that allowed up to 65% of a Korean-made product, like a television set, a cell phone, a car, to be made up of, of parts from third-party countries like China, Vietnam, even North Korea. Uh -huh. um, so Korean unions oppose the trade deal as well, seeing it as one that continues this race to the bottom where manufacturing moves from, from one country to the next to the next in search of you know, the cheapest labor mm -hmm. they can find, the weakest environmental regulations they can find, right. all in the name of profits. Right. And so yeah. Americans going to the store and mm -hmm. buying something that says made in South Korea, uh, there's no guarantee it actually is made in South Korea. Yeah, well, it's assembled in South Korea, but, you know, so that your car may come from South Korea, your television set may have been assembled in South Korea, but the vast majority of it could have been made in, right. in China or Vietnam right. or, yeah. or across the border in North Korea. And a lot of South Korean firms um, have sweatshops and makiadoras right across the border mm -hmm. in North Korea, despite the tensions between those countries. Uh, that continues going strong. Right. Yeah. And then I was reading the other day that uh, the expectation that jobs would be created in Detroit while we were making new cars, that in fact the Koreans are not very prone to buying American cars because of the low efficiency. No, that, that's right. I mean, the, the, the big change that the Obama administration made uh, from the Bush administration was that they got South Korea to weaken some of their environmental and safety standards on cars. Uh, in the hopes that more American SUVs would make it into the Korean market. Um, if you just look at the size of the countries, well, even if that happens, we're clearly going to be importing far more, you know, Korean cars here because of the size of our market, and it's a net loss for American workers. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, South Koreans don't have as much money. Um, they're looking for more efficient vehicles. There's a cultural... Um, condition about buying local, about buying, you know, Korean. Um, so it, it's very unlikely that we're going to be selling significantly more right. American yeah. cars yeah. in South Korea. Yeah. Yeah, it would be nice if we had the ability to have a local culture of buying local here that in the certainly United would. States, yeah, too. It would uh, create jobs, it would keep <laughs> yes. dollars circulating in the local economy. Mm -hmm. um, right. we, we need to do some work to get yeah. there. All right, yeah. So moving forward, Obama is now in the process of negotiating his first trade agreement. Yeah, the Trans-Pacific Free Trade Agreement, um, sometimes called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. uh, euphemistically. But, yeah. um, this is a deal that already with the countries at the table is very significant in its own right. Um, it's the United States, Vietnam, Singapore, Brunei, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Chile, and Peru. Um, just a few weeks ago, Japan, Mexico, and Canada announced their intentions to join. So r right there you have a very large trade agreement, um, but it's also intended as a docking agreement, which means that other countries can join it over time. And it's theoretically open uh, to countries throughout the Pacific Rim, the entire Pacific Rim. And this is really a deal that's about setting the new norms, the new standards for international trade, you know, for the coming period, for the next two, three decades. Um, and, you know, it, it sounds great, 21st century, high mm -hmm. standard agreement, but uh, the United States hasn't been forthco very forthcoming about explaining what those standards are going to be and what those new norms should be. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, most of the agreement has remained um, secret. You know, the official negotiating documents aren't made public. Um, we just learned recently uh, that the United States and all the other countries at the table actually signed uh, a contract, essentially, a memorandum of understanding, seeing that they wouldn't share hmm. the documents until a certain number of years after the deal has passed. Um, and, you know, at the same time, there are about 600 to 800 corporate lobbyists who have official advisor status, where they get access to the negotiating documents and to the negotiators and really have a seat at the table and saying, no, 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 no don't do that, do this. Uh -huh. Here, let me write some of this for you. Um, whereas civil society groups in the United States, journalists, uh, most members of Congress, and certainly the people most affected by what the U.S. is negotiating for and negotiating away, um, we have no right to see it until the deal is done, it's signed, at which point it's, it's next to impossible to change. Right, yeah. And so you didn't mention labor, or you didn't envir mention environmentalists being at the table. No, so there, are, there are maybe like one or two seats, three seats for 
you know, sort of left liberal nonprofits, mm -hmm. uh, labor groups, uh, in comparison to 600, 800 yeah. for the corporations. So, so uh, in the in the current <laughs> vernacular, the one percent is overly represented, <laughs> while the 99 yeah. is vastly yeah. under. And even you know, even those folks. You know, have to sign memos. You know, mm -hmm. they're sworn to secrecy mm -hmm. and can't share oh, okay. anything, even within their or organizations, let alone with the general public. Uh, so, okay, so very restricted public yes. access yeah. to. Okay, so, uh, but but we know that some of the documents have been have been leaked. Yeah, so um, some of them have been leaked, in, in particular the intellectual property chapter, um, which has a lot to do with uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, so, you know, yes, there's things like Hollywood movies and music and those types of things when you think of copyrights, um, but, but drugs, pharmaceuticals, medicines are, are the big part of it. Um, and right now, the Obama administration uh, is pushing for longer drug patents and other highly technical um, procedures that essentially extend the life of drug patents and make it harder uh, for for countries to manufacture or to purchase generic medications, mm -hmm. and so in the United States that spells higher drug prices. In a country like Malaysia or Vietnam, it can mean a death sentence for someone with HIV or tuberculosis who needs medication to survive. Um, you know, it, the money isn't there to pay mm -hmm. thirteen thousand dollars a year for a brand name drug as opposed to a couple hundred a year for a generic, mm -hmm. uh, and it means you know, people are just gonna die until mm -hmm. those patents run out. Right. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm just reminded while we're talking about you know, the, the patent process and how it increases costs mm -hmm. for these nations and for ourselves, uh, that we have these uh, various nations around the world, particularly in Europe, but elsewhere, you know, that are engaged in uh, increasing austerity programs Mm -hmm. uh, so these nations are not going to be having all uh, those kinds of extra funds. No, they're not. And, and in fact, you know, other provisions uh, that have been leaked in the Trans-Pacific Free Trade Agreement actually um, place limits on what foreign governments can do to even negotiate drug prices with the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the length of the patents, but also the negotiating process where, you know, most countries in the world have universal health care, government provided health care mm -hmm. for every person. Mm -hmm. um, and this is trying to even chip away at that. Mm -hmm. And I know she said New Zealand was one of the, one mm -hmm. of the people who are going to the table with this. But, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I recall that uh, New Zealand has some kind of national drug um, company. It's like a part of the government. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but pharma, um, uh, yeah, where they, pharma. Have a, they have a national drug program that um, provides and obtains medicine for their people. Mm -hmm. so, you know, right. So it seems like you know this would be a, a direct conflict with. Yeah, that. it certainly is, and it's a it's a top front page issue uh, in New Zealand mm -hmm. and many of the countries that we're negotiating with. You know, in the United States, for some reason, outside of shares like yours, <laughs> um, these these issues that affect drug prices, that affect jobs, that affect wages, uh, that affect banking regulations. Um, you know, they're front page news in mm -hmm. most countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, the corporate media hardly gives them any attention whatsoever. Right. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of those countries also already have trade agreements with the United States or with other countries. Yeah, which sort of, you know, give, gives, uh, you know, proof to the lie that this is about expanding market access, um, like you know, the administration said uh, was the point of the Korea Free Trade Agreement. Well, all right, you're creating a pact with, uh, you know, this group of countries where we already have free trade agreements. What's this really about? Um, and, yeah, uh, among that initial nine, um, we already had free trade agreements with countries, you know, representing, oh, I forget the exact number, about 70% of the combined G mm -hmm. GDPs of, the, of those nations. Um, and so, you know, well, number one, this is about access to even cheaper labor in, in places like Vietnam, where people clearly aren't going to be buying a lot of American-made products. Um, they just don't have the money. They don't, uh, they don't have the income to do that. Um, but Vietnam is being promoted throughout the world as the low-cost labor alternative to China, where, you know, wow. hey, you know, Apple, mm -hmm. Nike, you know, those Chinese workers are being paid too much come to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and then number two, you know, it's about expanding deregulation throughout the Pacific Rim. So, you know, with the drug prices, 
um, with banking regulations, with public procurement law, um, basically putting checks on democracy so that corporations can go in and not have to worry about environmental laws, not have to worry about banking regulations, not have to worry about you know, consumer safety standards um, being too high to try to cap them. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, could, you would think of an international agreement as setting a floor below which safety yeah. standards mm -hmm. couldn't drop, below which labor standards couldn't, couldn't drop. Um, these trade agreements tend to do the opposite. They yeah. tend to set a cap above which no country can go, and if they do, um, they're exposed to all sorts of new uh, penalties mm -hmm. for doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And wh wh why do you think that President Obama is particularly focused on the Pacific uh, Rim countries? Well, I mean, you know, if you look at, you know, a few years ago, um, the Bush administration was pushing the free trade area of the Americas basically expanding NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. the entire Western Hemisphere except for Cuba. Um, a, lot of, a lot of countries, uh, particularly in South America, um, said no. You know, we, we saw what happened in Mexico. We're not going to put up with this. Mm -hmm. um, there have been, you know, sort of left-wing people's revolts and new, more leftist governments coming into place. Um, and so, you know, the NAFTA model isn't going to fly mm -hmm. in large parts of South America uh, anymore. And so, you know, corporations are looking for, okay, well, where, where can we get in? Asia, you know, is the next big target. Um, let's negotiate with those countries that are, are willing to, you know, mm -hmm. willing to play ball that, you know, where, where the people don't have as much say. And then let's try to try to, you know, pressure the other countries to join, mm -hmm. you know, once, once those norms are set in place. Yeah. Do you think that uh, this is in part a reaction to some efforts on the part of China to increase their economics way through the area? It's, um, it's certainly an effort to, to try to isolate China and get China to play ball. I don't think it's... Um, a nationalist type of U.S. against China type of thing. I think it's corporations um, wanting complete say no matter what mm -hmm. country they're in. And all right, well, let's get the entire Pacific Rim to go along with that and then approach and try to get China to go along with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's personally what I think it's about. Okay. So on things like drug prices, on things like environmental regulations, on things like banking regulations, let's set those norms, let's set those standards. Um, and then approach China with them as a united bloc mm -hmm. um, and, and see if we can get them to go along too. Okay, all right. And has there been any kind of time frame set for when the administration wants this to be concluded? Um, most recently, uh, during the APEC meeting in Honolulu, um, they set the end of 2012 this year as, as, as their time frame for getting this agreement done. Um, you know, particularly with new countries like Japan and Mexico and Canada coming in, I think that's a little ambitious, um, but that's what they're shooting for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't seem like that they would want this to be an election issue. No, certainly not. I can't imagine, um, you know, we'll be hearing candidates talking a lot about this in 2012. Um, you know, free trade, poll after poll shows that free trade agreements are massively unpopular with voters, Democrats, Republicans, independents all agree uh, free trade agreements that offshore jobs mm -hmm. are something that we need to be opposing. Um, and, you know, actually, if you look at, pa you know, past election cycles, President Obama um, won his primary uh, on a fair trade platform promising to reform NAFTA, yeah. to reform mm -hmm. the WTO. Um, that's why he beat, in my opinion, uh, Hillary Clinton in states like Ohio and Pennsylvania mm -hmm. because of those promises. Um, so I can't imagine there, he's going to be up there talking about, or, or really very many elected mm -hmm. uh, officials or, or would-be politicians talking about how they're going to expand this job-killing yeah. model mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. To, you know, too many people um, have, have sort of seen the truth after, mm -hmm. over the past 15, 20 years of living under NAFTA. Right, yeah. And, and why, why do you think that you know, Obama, you know, campaigning against these agreements, or at least saying that they need to be renegotiated. Why has he changed his stance? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I think uh, on the one hand, um, he's surrounded himself with just the worst possible economic advisors on earth. Um, the people who gave us NAFTA and the WTO in the first place, the people who 
created the deregulation that led to the economic crisis. Um, you know, people right out of the, the not the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, mm -hmm. um, who, who created this system of, you know, let the market handle it. We, we, don't, we don't need regulations, we don't need government. Let the banks do what they will, let corporations do what they will, and everything will work out just hunky-dory. Hunky-dory. Um, so I think that's a big piece of it. I also think, frankly, uh, politically, um, the president has decided he needs Wall Street money to get reelected, that he's going to rely a lot more on TV ads than grassroots popular support um, for, for his new campaign. And to do that, he needs to show Wall Street that he can get things done that a mm -hmm. Republican couldn't get done. Um, that's why I believe he, he rammed through the Korea, Panama, and Colombia free trade agreements. And, you know, this, this is showing that, look how ambitious I am. Yeah. Trying to get something that you know no president since Clinton has been able to get done. Yes, uh, right. It's kind of like uh, a Democrat has to prove that he can screw the people as much as a Republican can. <laughs> more, you know, in this case, more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that past presidents have had uh, that President Obama doesn't have mm -hmm. is the fast track authority. Yeah. So Describe that a little bit. What is it and um, yes. what's the prospects of so Obama getting it? Fast track is a policy making process um, cooked up by Richard Nixon, who uh. actually wanted the authority to create trade agreements without any congressional approval whatsoever. Hmm. Um, Congress said no to that, but he came up with this as, as the next best idea of um, the, you know a president negotiating a trade agreement and then Congress, you know, having limited time for debate, um, no opportunity to create amendments in any way, shape, or form, uh, no filibuster, no ordinary, you know, procedures, but just a straight thumbs up or thumbs down vote. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Constitution says that, that Congress will set the terms of trade agreements. This limits that uh, dramatically. There's no other public policy making uh, in the United States that operates that way. Other treaties don't operate that way. It's, it's just trade policy. And so um, Fast Track expired a couple of years ago. Uh, already recently, um, the Obama administration has said that they'll need Fast Track not only to get the Trans-Pacific Free Trade Agreement through Congress, but also to actually complete the negotiations. When it gets down to those tricky last sort of hard bits of the negotiations, they're going to need to be able to prove that they have the authority to ram this through Congress uh -huh. before they can get the other countries to make concessions that are wildly unpopular in their countries. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're already talking about and saying that they need fast track renewed. And, you know, fast track is anti-democratic to the core. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to be doing everything we can to stop that from happening. Okay. All right. We've got about five minutes left. Sure. How do people get involved with a campaign to oppose this? Well, no, more. how do people mm -hmm. learn more details about this? And then how, how, how do we organize? Yeah. So um, in Oregon, people can get involved with the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. Um, we have organizing committees uh, in Portland and Salem in Eugene and, and people we work with throughout the state. Um, you can go to OregonFairTrade.org um, or give us a call at 503-736-9777 and we'll tell you how to get involved. Um, in mid-February we'll be doing sort of a, a road show throughout the state um, where we'll talk in much greater detail about the Trans-Pacific Free Trade Agreement, um, connect it to local issues around job loss, employment, uh, the environment, and, um, and let people know what they need to do to, to put pressure on their elected officials. Um, nationally, people can go to websites like the Citizens Trade Campaign, uh, citizenstrade.org, or Public Citizens uh, Global Trade Watch Program at tradewatch.org and, and find more. Okay, excellent. Very good. Uh, I, 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 I think that this is probably in my radar is one of the most important issues that people can get involved with and I, should get involved with. I mean, this is about making it easier for corporations to ship jobs around the world to whoever labors the most exploited environmental regulations are the weakest. So this is about jobs and the wages that jobs pay. And it's also about corporations putting checks on democracy. Um, having essentially veto power over environmental regulations, land use regulations, banking regulations, you name it. Right. Um, so th this is really about, you know, we're in this moment where the, the nation's really focused on corporate power 
and greed and how government is more accountable to Wall Street than it is to the people. Mm -hmm. um, this is the most ripe example of that, mm -hmm. uh, most in-your-face example of that that I can think of. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like to say that you know, we spent the last century plus time giving, or the Supreme Court has, giving corporations rights of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and this new century in the last, you know, 20 years of the last century is about how to international corporate personhood, how to internationalize corporate personhood. And I, I think this is just the next step in that process. Yeah, we've got a banner that says free trade agreements globalize corporate power. Oh, excellent. And that's what, mm -hmm. that's what this that's is That's exactly about. what it does, right. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, every time you give corporations power, you take it away from the rest of us and diminish democracy. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur, for being here. So, yeah, thanks for having great. me, David. Okay, great. Take Good. care. Good. So we've been talking with Arthur Stamolis, uh, who is the executive director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. We had, uh, I think we had some screens up earlier with some places to get additional information, Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. Uh, dot org, uh, Citizens Trade Campaign at citizenstrade.org, and then Public Citizen also uh, has some excellent material on their website, citizen.org and tradewatch.org. So I invite you to go to any of those sites and learn more about this really important issue. Uh, we need to get this issue up to the level of consciousness that, that it is in other nations. So uh, that concludes our program. If you um, like this program and your local public access program does not show it, uh, please contact the station, request they broadcast this show and other Populist Dialogue episodes. Populist Dialogues are available to them at no extra cost, at no cost period, at www.pegmedia.org. Uh, we also have uh, Paul C. and Fuegos is going to be doing a workshop on January 14th through the 15th here in Portland. Uh, and I'm, it the, was just on your screen, and I forget what the title of his workshop is, but it has to do with uh, we the people regaining our rights as citizens. Um, if you want to join the crew here at the Alliance for Democracy, uh, Populist Dialogues, please send me an email at davidafd at email dot at ymail.com. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or the Portland website afd-pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today. Without them, we wouldn't be on the air. So thank you, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Hollis Benedict, and Janet Morris. I hope that we'll see you again next week. Thank you for watching. Bye.